Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Eric Jordan, and it is my distinct honor to welcome you to the Class Day Ceremony for the Harvard Law School Class of 2014. Today is all about celebrating the talented, brilliant, and inspirational students and professionals who comprise the Harvard Law School community. Now, whether you joined that community three years ago as a naively optimistic 1L, or you transferred into this community two years ago, apparently eager to get away from your prior law school, or whether you joined this community last year by traveling across the globe in order to experience the world's worst winter, or if in the true risk-averse nature of a law student, you entered a joint degree program four years ago, we have all made it here to this day together. And for that accomplishment, I say congratulations. So to all the students, staff, faculty, and guests, I welcome you to the Harvard Law School Class Day Program of 2014. Thank you. Hello, I'm Andrew Chinsky, and I am and I'm proud to introduce Paul Perito, class of 1964 and president of the Harvard Law School Association. Paul has many years of both private and public experience, including service as a federal prosecutor, a presidentially appointed deputy director of the first drug czar's office, and chief counsel and staff director to the US House of Representatives Select Committee on Crime. Since leaving government, Paul started his own law firm, joined the law firm of Paul Hastings in Washington, DC, and now serves as the chairman, president, and COO of Star Scientific, which describes itself as a technology-oriented company with a mission to promote maintenance of a healthy metabolism and lifestyle. Perhaps most impressively, as Paul told me before we came on stage, he's the son of first-generation Americans who did not speak a word of English upon entering grade school. Please welcome Paul Perito. Most kind. Those are remarks that if my parents were alive, my uh, father's chest would swell with pride, and my mother would shake her head, disbelieving that those attributes belong to her son. Um, I have the honor and privilege of uh, serving as president of the Harvard Law School Association for the past years. On behalf of HLSA, congratulations to the 774 members the class of 2014 who will be receiving JD, LLM, and SJD degrees tomorrow. You're joining the ranks of the members of the oldest law school association in the country, perhaps in the world. In a fashion similar to the Harvard Law School, Harvard Law School Association has had a rich and vaunted history going back 128 years to 1886, when it was founded by the iconic and legendary figure, Oliver Wendell Holmes. Today, we are more than 38,000 members strong in 157 countries of the world and in all 50 states. HLSA is a unique membership organization in that because of the beneficence of this incredible law school, membership does not require the payment of dues. You get very few things free these days. Um, the purpose of HLA is to foster networking and mutual support between the law school, its alumni, its faculty, its students. We are not a fundraising organization. We are a friend-raising organization. The Harvard Law School Fund and the Development Office does a superb job under the leadership of Dean Oliveira finding sufficient funds to, to support scholarships, stipends, and, and loans to students in financial need. We sponsor events and programs and are involved in reunion planning. We are a vital link in outreach and engagement to the alumni community at large. There is an enormous power in the global HLSA network, which you now become a part of. We encourage new graduates to take advantage of this network and its mentoring opportunities. 
The network needs you, and you may need the network at certain stages of your life. The ranks you join today are among the most talented men and women in our world. Hopefully, many of them will touch your lives favorably as you advance in your careers. You need to think like the law school. Think globally, but act locally. Take advantage of HLS Connect, to the online directory. Learn about what we're doing. Stay in touch through LinkedIn and stay in touch regionally through HLS.org. The opportunities for engaging and networking themselves through both geographically based clubs throughout the world and through groups based on shared interests are astounding. We invite you to look at and join HLSA Recent Grad Council and HLSA Women's Alliance. Both are growing. Now let me share just a few thoughts with you. Professor Noel Fellman remarked at a leadership conference last year that by virtue of the fact that you have been admitted to and graduated from HLS, you are a member of an elite group of professionals who touch and change this world. Accordingly, each of you, as a graduate of the law school, is and will continue to be a change agent. I urge you to take advantage of that for the, in the benefit of your education to change the world for the better. As Dean Minow has often commented, law can serve several essential public purposes. One of the sad things is that the vast segment of society is legally underserved and will never have access to the types of lawyers that this institution produces. You have an opportunity, each of you, to make a difference. And that is in helping people who need help. It will better their lives, but it will better your life. And I close with two thoughts. Andrew referred to my parents, my mother, left school in the eighth grade to help support her family, but she would say in Sicilian to me, translated, five, seven words that she wanted to have embedded in my DNA. Work hard, think big, dream impossible dreams. That's what this school can do for you. Secondly, I encourage you to lead a robust and interesting life. You are the best of the best the top of the top. You have all the tools needed for success. And don't be afraid of failure or setbacks. They're great learning experiences. Your success, your success is limited only by the extent of your imagination and your commitment for hard work and perseverance. Congratulations to each of you and to your parents on this stunning achievement of graduating from this incredible law school. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Arvind Sahoni, and I'm also one of the 3 class marshals for the class of 2014. Now today, I have the great honor of introducing Preet Bharara, the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York. Now for a man who once got a public shout out from Bruce Springsteen for his work, Mr. Bharara is today sadly stuck with me. Mr. Bharara is a graduate of Harvard College and Columbia Law School and has worked extensively in the public and private sectors. He spent seven years with two law firms in New York before becoming a US, an assistant U.S. attorney in 2000. In 2009, President Obama nominated him for the top job at SDNY, and he was confirmed by a Senate vote of 98 to 0. In his current role, Mr. Barrara has renewed the office's focus on pursuing terrorism, public corruption, and gang activity. He is perhaps best known, though, for his dedication to prosecuting financial frauds. Mr. Barrara has been called the Sheriff of Wall Street, 
and is consistently called the modern day Elliot Ness. A senior official in Governor Cuomo's office said, you just have to conclude that he is one of, if not the most important, most effective law enforcement officers in the country. In 2012, Time Magazine included him on their list of the 100 most influential people, alongside President Obama, Hillary Clinton, and Rihanna. It's actually quite the list, you should check it out. <laughs> My favorite anecdote though about Mr. Barrara comes from an interview he did with CNBC's Jim Cramer in front of a crowd of hedge fund managers. He opened by saying to the crowd, um, I'm sorry, I didn't realize how many of you there were today. I didn't bring nearly enough subpoenas for all of you. <laughs> and as the crowd nervously laughed, kind of just like you guys did, uh, he interjected and said, obviously I'm kidding, I brought more than enough. <laughs> in all seriousness, Mr. Barrara is a dedicated public servant and he remains at the forefront of fighting corruption at the highest levels. His work should be a model to all of us and it serves as an important reminder that the rule of law still matters. I am personally so excited that he's here today and I hope that you all will join me in, in, in welcoming uh, Preet Bharara, the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Dean Minow, distinguished faculty, proud parents, family, friends, and members of the Harvard Law School class of 2014, congratulations to you. You have so much to be proud of and so very much to be grateful for. Uh, I want to congratulate by name the four most awesome members of the class of 2014 because they used to work for me. Edley Rivera, Kyle Wurschbach, Heather Alpino, and Claire Gehenno. Congratulations. Uh, this is a proud day for everyone who is here, uh, but for the parents, I think, especially. And not just for the graduates' parents. It turns out that my own parents are here. My mom and dad are seated in the third row. Uh, you can clap for my parents. So a few months ago, my, my dad calls me when he sees the announcement that Harvard Law School put out about the program, and he tells me that, that he and mom were going to come up for it. And I say uh, to him, Dad, look, I'm really touched, um, but you don't have to drive all the way up from New Jersey. You just had knee surgery. It's a long haul. You know, it's fine, Dad. Again, I'm touched, but don't, don't worry about it. My dad gets all serious, and he says to me, breathe. How could I not come and miss a once-in-lifetime chance, once-in-lifetime chance to see the Mindy Kaling? <laughs> Look, that's, that's fine. Mindy's parents are here to see me. So, you know, yes, we've got um, two Indian Americans today for the price of one. <clears throat> apparently, apparently it's India Day at Harvard Law School. Uh, I hope that you enjoy the lamb vindaloo and the chicken tikka masala that will be served after. Not, not to belabor the point, but, but I am curious about how the decision-making process worked. Like, how did, that, how did that meeting go exactly? I imagine these guys, your class marshals, were sitting around and someone says, I think we got the U.S. attorney, Preet Bharara is coming. And then another class marshal said what? You know, I was just thinking, as long as we're going Indian, <laughs> maybe we should have a funny Indian, I, you know? <laughs> Again, don't get me wrong, I love the Mindy Kaling. But I can't help but get the feeling that, that Harvard was a little concerned, you know, asking themselves, can Barrara really carry the whole program? And obviously it determined no. <laughs> so, you know, I'm a little hurt because, because I did some research and, and I understand that two years ago you asked Attorney General Eric Holder to be your class day speaker. Apparently you did not feel the need to also invite Chris Rock. And last year, and last year you had Jeffrey Tubin, and you did not hedge your bets with Jerry Seinfeld. So I'm just, I'm just saying, 
you know, but it's okay. I will, I'll do my best. I'll do the best that I, that I can. Uh, it really is, though, an honor to be here. I have had an unexpectedly productive trip so far. I arrived last evening, stopped by the business school, dropped off a couple of subpoenas, <laughs> arrested three guys for insider trading, and finished off the evening sipping a scorpion bowl at the Kong. <laughs> By the way, I hope you've gotten to know your business school colleagues because they, they are your future clients. <laughs> so anyway, I'm sitting, I'm sitting at the Hong Kong restaurant, which I will note has changed like not at all <laughs> in the 24 years since I used to be a regular patron when I was in the college. And so I'm sipping the scorpion bowl through that ridiculous kitty straw that they give you uh, and reviewing my prepared text for today, which was replete with lofty quotations from Oliver Wendell Holmes and Felix Frankfurter and, of course, one Mr. Langdell. And then I had what people call a moment of clarity that will happen to you when you drink a scorpion bowl. <laughs> and the moment of clarity was this. You don't really want or need me to read and quote from legal scripture. Not on class day, at least, and especially when you haven't even given us caps and gowns. So instead, what I thought I would do is rather than speak esoterically about the law, I would speak more pragmatically about how to be successful and happy in law practice. Now, that is not so easy as it sounds, to be both successful and happy as a lawyer. You may be asking yourself, what should I be focused on in my first job, pleasing the partner, should I be networking, getting clients, setting myself up for the next job? A simple and excellent answer is actually provided by a scene from one of the greatest Martin Scorsese movies made. It's called The Departed. If you haven't seen it, you should see it. It's set around here uh, in the Boston area, and it's loosely based on notorious mobster Whitey Bulger, so you can see why I might like this film. Mark Wahlberg is in the movie, and he plays a cop. And there's a scene where a law enforcement officer uh, operation goes south, and Wahlberg's character is upset, and he starts asking questions. And somebody says to Wahlberg, who the F are you? And Wahlberg says, I'm the guy who does his job. You must be the other guy. And I submit that there is more wise career counsel in that short scene than in many volumes that you might read. Because that is where your focus should always be being the guy who does his job, whether you are an associate, a law clerk, an assistant DA, a public defender, or anything else. Nothing else matters but doing your job and doing it well, every day, even when it's hard, even when it's tedious, even when it's dull, even when the work seems small and beneath your brand name schooling and God-given talent. It means being the guy who does his job, even when no one is looking, and no one will know the good ideas came from you. If you do that, not only the next job, but your entire career will take care of itself. Trust me on that. Let me put it a different way. Almost exactly four years ago today, Philadelphia Phillies pitcher Roy Halladay achieved one of the most rare and difficult things in all of sports. He pitched a perfect game. Nine innings, no hits, no walks, 27 up, 27 down. He was perfect, and he is in the history books because of it. Then four months later, on October 6th of that year, in the very same season, Halliday threw a no-hitter. Not quite perfect, but pretty darn close. He did it, by the way, in a playoff game. In all of baseball history, only two people have ever thrown a no-hitter in the postseason. Just two. The Phillies pitching coach was asked by a reporter what advice he had given his ace. And the coach said that he had given Roy Halladay a simple instruction. He said, go out there and try to be good. If you just go out there and try to be good, you've got a chance to be great. And that is literally the best advice that I have ever heard. It has stayed with me, and I hope it stays with you. <clears throat> I think there is a tendency for people like you, who are so successful and so accomplished and so credentialed, to think every endeavor is like a baseball game in which you're going to go out and pitch a perfect game, but it doesn't work that way. 
You should have high aspirations. You should want to be monumentally successful. But you've got to do it one pitch at a time. It sounds cliche, but you've got to do it one pitch at a time. Pitch after pitch after pitch. That's what develops into a perfect game, or by analogy, an outstanding career. And by the way, no one who ever pitched a perfect game in baseball went to the mound that day expecting to do so. Because not only is that unrealistic, it is the height of arrogance. And yet I see people all the time make that very mistake. They want to be great before they've learned how to be good. They want to be on the big matter before, before they've handled a small one. They want to try a case before they've argued a motion. They want to be generals before they have been good soldiers. But first, I submit, you have to learn some craft. Actually learn how to practice law in whatever area you first pick. Craft and competence will always matter more than connections. But in a lot of places, people often behave in a way that suggests the reverse is true. So learn some craft. You will stumble. It won't always go great. It didn't for me. I remember the first major deposition I ever took. Uh, I couldn't figure out how to ask a proper question. It got so bad that the adversary asked for a break and then apologized to the court reporter, and I didn't understand what he was apologizing about, and I realized he was apologizing for me. So that kind of hurt a little bit. I never forgot that, uh, but I got better, and you will too. And once you have learned your craft and learned it well, you will be in good stead always. And I guarantee you will be swimming in opportunities. Let's talk about humility for a moment. Humility, I think, is underrepresented and undervalued in law practice, which is too bad. So why is humility important? Mostly so you don't become unbearable. <laughs> and also because it will keep you open-minded and striving to always do better. So find someone in your life who will help keep you humble. Luckily, I have an abundance of those people in my own life. Uh, my daughter, for example, a uh, quick true story, she is now 13. But three years ago, uh, we had just won a big uh, white collar case and there was a nice profile about her dad in the New York Times and I thought I should have my daughter read this so she can be proud of dad. So she begrudgingly read the article and at the end I recall that it ends with a quote from me that's very sort of finger waggy and, and uh, chest thumpy uh, about how you know, we're not gonna stop fighting against Wall Street crime. So my daughter finishes reading the article and looks up and I'm waiting to see what my daughter is gonna say and how proud she is of her father. And she said, uh, rolling her eyes slightly, and this is a direct quote, Daddy, why are you such a drama queen? <laughs> so be sure you have people like that in your life. If you don't, my daughter is available. <laughs> a part of humility, by the way, is becoming comfortable with self-doubt. It took me a while to appreciate this. You think that when I became the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York, a storied institution since 1789 that I said to myself, well, it's about time. Finally, I can fix 220 years of inferior leadership. Uh, you know, not quite. Here's how I did feel. I felt nervous and afraid and unworthy. I was terrified that I might not live up to the tradition of that great place, that I might not ultimately measure up to the job, that I would be a disappointment to the people who had supported me. You know, there's a hundred years of U.S. attorneys' portraits on the hallway wall leading up to my office. And I walk by them every day, and they appear to be telling me every morning, don't screw it up, kid. And so even now, after almost five years that have gone pretty well, I get nervous and afraid still. And if I ever lose that feeling, I think that's the day that I should step down. And don't get me wrong, I do have self-confidence also, but at the same time, and on a fairly frequent basis, roaring self-doubt. But you'll find that self-doubt in moderation is animating and motivating, not paralyzing. In my view, leaders who have purged themselves of all self-doubt will not be leaders for long, and in my view, are dangerous while in command. I have learned over time that self-doubt is my friend and arrogance my enemy. Now let's talk about something that will bring you down from time to time. 
It's called criticism. So brace yourself, because you will receive it, especially if you rise high or take a stand on something, and it will hurt, it will even sting. Now, there are some people in the world who are not bothered by criticism, for whom everything just rolls right off their back. Those are type B people. But criticism will bother you a lot because you are type A people. And I know what you guys are like because I'm a little bit that way myself. You are the kind of people who are super competitive, even when playing board games with children. <laughs> By the way, there's nothing wrong with that. Kids got to learn. The key, the key, I think, to learn is to learn which criticism to take to heart and uh, to, to make yourself better and to improve and which criticism to laugh off, which criticism is well-placed and which is foolish. Trust me, I've gotten to know a lot about criticism in this job. Sometimes just doing your job uh, and doing the right thing will provoke criticism. I've been criticized from the left. I've been criticized from the right. I've been criticized by various governments. I have been banned from Russia. That's true. Um, sometimes criticism is valid, and you have to take it seriously and be uh, smart about it. The point is, don't be dismissive about criticism, but be discerning about it. Here's another quick story. So you may have heard some of you about a case we brought uh, last year in which the State Department arrested a mid-level Indian diplomat female, Devyani Kobragade for visa fraud in connection with lies about she would ultimately pay her domestic worker. Not the crime of the century, but a serious crime nonetheless. That's why the State Department opened the case. That's why the State Department investigated it. That's why the career agents in the State Department asked career prosecutors in my office to approve criminal charges. So that case basically caused an international incident. Uh, now, putting aside disputes about the merits of the case, Somehow, the Indian government and the Indian press decided that the case was brought by me, an Indian American, for all manner of bad personal reasons. Never mind that the case was initiated and investigated by career law enforcement officials and that I became personally aware of it only a day or two before the arrest had been scheduled. Talk show hosts in India took to calling me a, a self-loathing Indian who made it a point to go after people from the country of his birth, which was a bit odd since the alleged victim was also Indian. An Indian official basically asked on television, who the hell is Preet Bharara? And the criticism got increasingly intense over time, which might not have bothered me so much, except that it bothered my parents, who came from India to this country uh, as adults. And that was tough because it bothered them. And then it bothered me again when I had to explain to my daughter who overheard a conversation in the house of, of what it meant to be called an Uncle Tom, because that's what I was being called by journalists in South Asia. So that was not so pleasant. And I will admit that I was upset, uh, as I think a normal human being might be. But then as the accusations got more and more absurd, they became downright comical, and I got some of my perspective back. After all, Indian critics were angry because even though I hail from India, I appeared to be going out of my way to act American and serve the interests of, American, of America, which was also kind of odd because I am American and the words United States are actually in my title. And then I saw this line of attack in the foreign press and in serious press, it was written that Barara had undertaken this case to quote, serve his white masters presumably Eric Holder and Barack Obama. <laughs> so you get my point. So that is an example of criticism that is stupid. And I realized, by the way, that I had a ready response to the Indian official who asked, who the hell is Preet Bharara? And it's this. I'm the guy who does his job. You must be the other guy. A couple of final general points. Uh, work for good people. Don't work for jerks, no matter how smart and talented you think they are. And don't be a jerk yourself. Also, while you're making your career happen, you are allowed to have fun, even if the job at hand is deadly serious. We have fun at the US Attorney's Office because we never take ourselves too seriously. And I think that's important. 
Humorlessness cor correlates directly with pomposity and I believe also with failure. So now I realize that a lot of this advice seems not unique to the practice of law. Well, there's a reason for that. The practice of law is a lot like any other endeavor in life. It can be messy and difficult and stressful, but the most important advice is the same. Do your job and be humble. Work for good people and be good to those who work for you. Accept criticism, unless it's foolish. Have fun and embrace humor. Like other endeavors, the practice of law is about each pitch, about going out there and trying to be good every day instead of trying to pitch a perfect game on your first try. But I do want to conclude with a thought that is particular to the practice of law, especially for a Harvard Law School graduate. And it's this. The degree you are receiving is a precious and powerful gift. Yes, I know you have worked very hard, but it is a gift nonetheless. So don't squander it. There are people who would give a limb for the gift that you are getting this week. And you should be exceptionally proud of the career that you have chosen. Now, I know that not everyone loves lawyers, and I know that we lawyers are, as a group, much maligned. But I continue to believe in the quaint and uncommon view that to become a lawyer is to join a noble profession. I continue to believe also that there is no one better situated to prevent cruelty, promote equality, and preserve liberty than the person who has genuinely de dedicated himself or herself to becoming both a master and a servant of the law. The potential power of a law degree is, I believe, unmatched in American society. No one is better situated to stand up for an ideal or expose corruption or champion underdogs or defend unalienable rights. I think it is not an overstatement to suggest that the power of your degree gives you a degree of power that few possess, fewer know how to use, and fewer still know how to put to good purpose. People spend their entire lives waiting for the chance to do something meaningful, to make a difference in the world. For so many people, too many people, that moment never comes. But you, simply by virtue of your new law degree from Harvard no less, will have that opportunity every single day. And I hope and pray that you will seize it. The world needs you to seize it. Now, I was trying to make it through the speech without quoting anyone more distinguished than Mark Wahlberg. Uh, but I saw, and, and maybe some of you have not seen, the sad news this morning that beloved American author and poet Maya Angelou had passed away. And though she is gone, her words will always be with us. And among the very many beautiful words she has strung together were these. I've learned that you shouldn't go through life with a catcher's mitt on both hands. You need to be able to throw something back. So please, go out there and just try to be good. Do it one pitch at a time. And don't forget to throw something back. The world is waiting for all of you. Good luck. Good afternoon, graduates, families, and friends. My name is Alejandro Mont, and I'm another of the class marshals and a proud representative of the LLM class of 2014. I have the honor to introduce the winner of the 2014 Susan Richardson Staff Appreciation Award, Tracy Ann Daly. <laughs> Tracy was born in Kingston, Jamaica and moved to the United States at the age of seven. She earned her bachelor's degree from Northeastern University in Boston and majored in political science and pre-law. At Harvard Law School, she has held different positions since 2011, and she's currently working as the student activities coordinator at the Dean of Students' Office, advising and supporting students' leaders in their co-curricular and extracurricular activities. 
There are many reasons why Tracy is being honored today. As a summary, which only touches the surface of all the compliments that Tracy deserves, students have described her as friendly, generous, responsive, knowledgeable, and extremely helpful, making herself available even when she's not in the office and as the student's best friend and go-to person at DOS. Tracy's professional and human qualities have made a huge impact in our community, and her smile, kindness, and joyfulness have inspired all of us. Without further ado, please join me again in recognizing the winner of the 2014 Susan Richardson Staff Appreciation Award, Tracy Ann Daly. Thank you, Alejandro. This is a little more intimidating than sitting at my desk. <laughs> I feel so honored to be standing here today. I choose to believe I received this award for more than just being the face next to the candy bowl. <laughs> I like to think it had more to do with the late night pancake breakfast, the movie nights in Austin, Halloween parties, barristers ball, orientation, RA meetings, parody, excessive emails about locker cleanout, Super Bowl parties, outlaw, the Oscar party. I think we all get the point. <laughs> um, I always felt a little more connected to this class because I started here when you guys were one else. <laughs> I felt like we've grown up together. While just sitting <laughs> at the candy bowl, I tried to get to know each of you on a more personal level, as personal as you can get in the time it takes to eat a mini Twix. <laughs> I've heard about vacations, summer jobs, engagements, breakups, and my favorite, sports trash talking. I think we all agree Boston is the sports mecca of the US. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> um, I've been able to witness some great debates at the front desk in front of that candy bowl. Romney versus Obama, open outline banks versus closed outline banks, and most recently, Solange versus Jay-Z. <laughs> <laughs> I had the privilege to view some of the comments you guys wrote, um, and I have to say one of the major themes was my responsiveness. My father, who's sitting somewhere in the audience, was not as impressed with my dedication, especially when I was responding to emails from my vacation in India. Special thank you to Verizon for that. Um, thank you guys so much. This means a lot to me. Congratulations. <laughs> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Emmy Rono, and I am delighted today to introduce the winner of this year's Albert Sachs Front Award, Professor Tyler Giannini. <laughs> Professor Giannini began his career at the age of 24 uh, by co-founding a nonprofit organization, Earthrights, with a goal to link human rights to environmental protection. His work, among other things, involved training community members to understand and be engaged in human rights work. He joined Harvard Law School in the year 2004 as an advocacy fellow and subsequently became the director of the International Human Rights Clinic. Professor Giannini is honored today not only for his excellence in teaching, but also for his tireless efforts in supporting students, not just in academic work, but also in their personal affairs. He has undying dedication and commitment to his work and seeks to mentor uh, the next generation of advocates for social justice. Professor Giannini um, has been described by many students as seeming to have more than 24 hours in a day because he's perpetually accessible to students and active in improving the life of students. For example, he's, in, he's been involved in uh, the Public Service Venture Fund and also in human rights uh, symposiums. Professor Giannini cares deeply about justice as a broad forum, as a, as a broad concept, and um, this informs his commitment and dedication and passion in his work. His desire 
is to continuously be a resource and to train others and hopefully arouse in them the same level of passion and commitment in human rights work. He said to me that uh, human rights is a core of his person, the core of who he is and the fabric of who he is. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Professor Tyler Giannini. Thank you for the honor. It's really humbling. In fact, I think I'm more terrified than anything else right now to be here with all of you. I normally teach the classes about the size of 20. There's a few more people out here than that. But it really is an honor to be here with Dean Minow, faculty, staff, friends, parents, and the graduating class. I'm deeply moved to receive this teaching award from you, the graduating class. And what has struck me, what continues to strike me, is how strange it feels to be singled out. Perhaps this is because I have always been part of a team in my human rights work. And it has never been more perfectly realized than here with the students and clinicians at our human rights clinic. In reflecting on today, and I'm a clinician, so you better believe reflection is part of what I do. I thought back, I wondered, how was I crazy enough to start an NGO during my last year of law school, which then took me to Thailand for 10 years? And somehow I ended up here at Harvard teaching. And the answer is really clear to me now. There have always been others with me all along the way. I've never done it alone, never. And really, all of us together are essential to success, whether in practice or in teaching. This is the way the law works in my experience. This is the way struggles for justice work. Okay, I give you that occasionally there's an Albert Einstein of law in our midst. There are probably a few of them in our faculty. But that's not the norm. What is the norm is that the law practice is a cooperative effort, especially when you're working for justice. I look back 20 years ago next week, I went to Thailand for the first time. It was my second summer of law school, and it was a defining summer. A law school classmate and I, along with an advocate from Burma, decided to start a human rights organization that we called Earth Rights. My first day in Thailand, I also met Ang, the woman that would become my wife, my partner. So a pretty big summer. And these are the relationships that have shaped my life both in a professional sense and also in the personal sense. But in my career as in your, yours, the law is a vital piece of the puzzle. You need the talent to dissect legal arguments, to research, to write, to persuade others. Working with you in our clinical teams, I've seen it firsthand. You have these talents you have these skills. Yes, these talents and skills will no doubt continue to evolve. These are the tools of your craft and they are your foundation. But recently in a conversation with my young daughters, Amaya and Reina, who are both here today, they reminded me that the tools of your craft are only part of the story. My kids have taught me to slow down and to appreciate the small moments in life. And they are absolutely right. As I look back at my 10 years at Harvard, it's not the legal arguments that I remember most, but the moments along the way where our teams have literally hummed. 
I remember being on clinical missions in South Africa, in Bolivia, in Burma, and having breakthroughs on legal theories as we thrashed out how to link abuses with the perpetrators. I remember this year wrestling with the wording of a single s sentence with a clinical team over and over again until we got it absolutely right. And then seeing the legal argument end up in a judge's decision. I remember the time another team camped out all night in the freezing cold, colder than today, on the steps of the Supreme Court so they could hear oral argument on the case that we were working on. I remember the moment one of those students, now an alum, put her name as counsel on a brief for the very first time, joined by students who put their names on a brief for the first time as well. I remember another colleague signing her first amicus brief and the joy of sharing that moment with her. I remember seeing an alum leading a clinical team and then launching her own new nonprofit last year. Each moment represents a culmination of collective effort. I don't always remember the specifics of an argument or the specific brief that we were working on. But I do remember these moments. They are what give meaning, what give texture to the work. I've seen the good the law can do, but also the evil it can bring. How the law can be used to oppress in places like Burma, in South Africa, and elsewhere. I've also seen how it can advance justice. On occasion, we do get a win, but most of the time, it's much less clear. Perhaps this is why those of us who work for justice do it with others, because the solidarity of the struggle is part of how we measure success. Look, the work we do is hard. Everybody knows that. The problems we face today like generations before us, are new and challenging. Whether it's preparing for a Supreme Court hearing or figuring out a transition in a post-war conflict or determining ways to address climate change or poverty in the coming decades, the problems are too large, too complex for one person. This is why the practice of social justice is not done alone. One only needs to spend an evening at the law school's annual dinner celebrating public service, or one day in a clinic during a push on a case filing to know that's true. A recent exchange with a colleague during an oral argument brought it all home for me. We were sitting at counsel's table with another colleague who was we were sitting at the table, and another colleague was standing at the podium and arguing. We quietly jotted a few notes, and at one point I passed, her, passed one to her saying, I'm so glad you came up with that argument. Then another question from the judge, and there it was. Work that the clinical team had done that very morning the research and drafting of a crafted answer to an anticipated question. From the students' computers to the outline of counsel and into the courtroom in a matter of hours. I passed my colleague another note saying how great the students were. And then she jotted a few simple words on a post-it. It read, quote, added all together were a good lawyer. I keep that note in my wallet. Two weeks later, we had a decision in our favor 
based on the arguments we made together that day. We indeed, added all together, had been one good lawyer. I love this job. It's the best job in the world. What I love is that the teaching is so wrapped up with the practice and the learning that I do with you. I'm confident you, this year's graduating class, are as committed as any class before you to the causes you care about. And I know that you have the talent, the insights, the intellect to make a profound contribution. May you have as many memorable moments in the years ahead as I've had. More, I hope. Memories and moments, ones that come from a love of luring, a love of service, a love of teaching and learning, and a love of working and being with others. Congratulations to all of you. Celebrate today, celebrate tomorrow, and thank you. Good afternoon, I am Martha Minow and I'm still the Dean. It is just my great, great pleasure to be here with you all, to welcome family and friends, and to say to the class of 2014, congratulations. Your amazing accomplishments, individually and collectively, really makes this day and tomorrow so meaningful. Today's is class day. Today is the day that we recognize your class. It's also a day that we recognize your contributions to making this day. You selected the speakers, and that is what our guests today have in common. So Preet Bharara and Mindy Kaling, that's why you're here. This is who the class wanted, and you brought the class together, a very diverse class at that. In addition, you, class of 2014, picked these outstanding honorees. And Tracy Ann and Tyler Giannini, I want to salute you and your work here. Paul Perito, thank you for being here. And I actually see some gifts that I'm going to give out. I don't know why no one did, but here, this is what I do. I think I did it too soon. Anyway, <laughs> I am so honored to share the stage with these amazing people and to be here with extraordinary students. And my great privilege today is to recognize students who stand with their passion and commitment for service, both to Harvard Law School and to the larger world. And it's my great pleasure to introduce them to you. I'm going to start by talking about pro bono, public service. The law school requires 40 hours of pro bono work, but the average number of hours performed by our students this year was more than 10 times that. 582 hours was the average. And indeed, 99 students volunteered more than 1,000 hours. That's really something. Nine students perform more than 2,000 hours, and their names are proudly displayed in this program. How proud we are of the commitment to service of all of our students making a difference on behalf of people who really need that help. The JD student in the graduating class who performs the highest number of pro bono service hours receives an award named for Andrew L. Kaufman granted each year in the honor of the professor who was instrumental in creating and supporting the pro bono program here. 
The Office of Clinical and Pro Bono Programs annually determines the winner based on records of total completed hours submitted by students and the 2014 winner for completing, are you ready? 2,329 hours is Kimberly Page Newberry. Kimberly, you are truly dedicated to learning how to be a criminal defense lawyer and advocating for justice in the capital defense system. Kimberly started her work 1L year with Harvard Defenders and the Prison Legal Assistance Program and was the co-managing director of that program, fondly called PLAP, during her third year. She also participated in a spring break pro bono trip to the Mississippi Delta where students presented a workshop and drafted a guide to estate planning for the owners of small firms. At HLS, she has engaged in clinical work every semester in which it's been possible, including the Housing Law Clinic and the Criminal Justice Institute. She went to Kentucky in the middle of winter for the death penalty clinic at the Kentucky Capital Post-Conviction Conflict Unit, where she worked on developing a unique Eighth Amendment claim and drafting the pleading. Kimberly's volunteer work at the Prison Legal Services in Boston represents in incarcerated individuals in their suits against the prisons for civil rights violations. And during the summer, she has worked at the Capitol Appeals Project in New Orleans and the Southern Center for Human Rights in Atlanta. One supervisor said this about Kimberly. Kimberly has been the most enjoyable intern I have ever supervised. Working with her allowed me to look at two cases that I've been on for years in a new light. Kimberly, congratulations, and we thank you for your contributions. <laughs> Three years ago, we lost a beloved colleague, mentor, and friend. William Stuntz, a renowned scholar of criminal justice, was an evangelical Christian and in his long battle with cancer, he actually comforted other people while he went on his painful journey. Bill's influential scholarship over the past three decades addressed the full spectrum of issues related to criminal justice and procedure, from the overcrowding of prisons and racial disparities and incarceration, to the appropriate role of faith, emotion, and mercy in the penal system. He imbued his work and his life with a vision of mercy and compassion. In his decade on the Harvard Law faculty, Bill touched the lives of so many. He was honored with the Sachs Freud Teaching Award in 2004. Students, faculty members, alumni remember him as beloved mentor and friend. And in his honor, established the William J. Stuntz Award to recognize the graduating student who, in his or her time at Harvard Law School, has demonstrated an exemplary commitment to justice, respect for human dignity, and compassion. Faculty, staff, and students nominate uh, individuals for the Stunts Award, and the award serves as a beacon to many future Harvard Law students whose personal and professional goals transcend any ordinary idea of lawyering. And I'm pleased to announce that the winner of the William J. Stunts Award this year is Michael David Klinger. Cornell, Michael regularly visited maximum security prisons as a volunteer teaching assistant, and he developed his commitment to criminal justice reform. After graduating from college, he served as a Coro Fellow in Public Affairs and worked on the Innocence Project, a national nonprofit litigation and public policy organization focusing on exonerating the wrongfully convicted individuals through DNA testing and reforming the criminal justice system. Michael's experiences taught him that wrongfully convicted individuals return to society with difficulties in fiscal, social, and spiritual realms. Working closely with individuals for, informed his decision to seek graduate degrees in theology and law with a dual focus on criminal justice reform and nonprofit administration, focusing on the issue of reentry. Michael seeks to serve individuals who so often find themselves on the extreme margins of society, those who are addicted, incarcerated, illiterate, mentally ill. 
At the Harvard Divinity School, he launched the Harvard Divinity School's Innocence Project Engagement Group, a student organization committed to raising awareness about the causes and consequences of wrongful convictions and engaging in reform efforts. His work inspired students at the Kennedy School to form a similar effort, and the two partnered in supporting the passage of a DNA access bill here in Massachusetts. And at Harvard Law School, Michael has collaborated with the Harvard Prison Studies Project and the Criminal Justice Institute on events involving exonerated individuals and their families. He's returned to the Innocence Project past summer as the Waller Public Interest Fellow, where he authored two strategic plans aimed at enhancing the advocacy power of those who've been exonerated. Michael's clinical work at HLS has included work as a public defender through the Criminal Justice Institute on behalf of indigent clients in Roxbury. And through the Capital Punishment Clinic, he worked for the Texas Defender Service and represented several indigent clients on death row. A true campus leader, Michael has served on the executive boards of the Social Enterprise Law Association and the Harvard Mindfulness Society. And outside the law school, Michael has continued his volunteer work with the Phoenix House Foundation, where he supports fundraising and motivational talks for homeless teens dealing with chronic substance abuse. Michael, in recognition of your work advancing the cause of justice, respect for human dignity, and compassion, it is my honor to recognize you with this year's William J. Stuntz Award. Congratulations. <laughs> the Frank Righeimer Award is given annually to a graduating student in recognition of exceptional citizenship within this law school community. Nominations are received by faculty, staff, and students, and I'm pleased to announce this year's recipient is Lisa Michelle Lana. <laughs> Lisa Lana, said one of the nominations, is a name that every Harvard Law student 2014 graduate knows. And that is not just because of all of the emails that she sends out. Lisa is a friendly, familiar face, the nomination continues, who strives every day to make HLS a better place. And I know personally that that is true. Lisa's Section 4, shout out Section 4, <laughs> classmates singled her out for her contributions to their first year section, where she made the effort to get to know everyone in the section and to coordinate a variety of events that help create a real sense of community that continues to this day. The student body elected Lisa as president of the student representative board, our student government, not just for one year, but for two years. She has served with verve, with vision, and with her fine vice president, Andrew London. She, they have enacted a number of reforms benefiting the student body every day. Now, even though most people arrive uh, when they are three L's, moving away from leadership positions, saying they want to pass on the baton, but really they want to think about other things, Lisa actually ran for office a second time, as do Andrew, and their willingness to follow through on initiatives they had launched is really incredible. Lisa has also been active in clinical activities, working as co-chair of the Mississippi Delta Project, student attorney for the Prison Legal Assistance Program, working in the Child Advocacy Clinic, and the Harvard Immigration Project. And that's not all. Lisa has worked with the Criminal Justice Institute, where she represented individuals involved in the criminal courts. And a tireless advocate there, she had a bigger caseload than just about everyone. And she was always the first person there to lend a hand when people needed a partner to investigate, to deliver subpoenas, or to travel to the courthouse to file motions. One classmate said it best, and I quote, I have never nominated anyone for anything. But I, when I read the description for this award, I knew exactly who it should go to. That is right, and congratulations, Lisa. Our next award honors uh, one of my colleagues, the late Professor David Westfall, who taught at the law school for more than 50 years until just before his death in 2006. 
David loved students, and students loved him. At a time when many would have contemplated retirement, David volunteered to lead what was then the new innovation at the Harvard Law School, first-year sections, and he enjoyed terrific popularity in his role, and it's not just because of the free food. It is fitting that we honor his memory by recognizing a student who has made significant contributions in the first year section and class. And this year's David Westfall Memorial Award goes to Vivian Ban. A section mate wrote, and I quote, at the end of our 1L year, our section leader, Professor John Manning, remarked to us that we were one of the most collegial and amicable sections he had ever had. I think the friendly atmosphere was fostered in large part by Vivian Ban, who led our section events committee and was welcoming and inclusive of everyone. Vivian continued to organize events during second and third years, keeping section one strongly connected long after they were officially no longer 1Ls. And when Vivian's work with class of 2004, specifically section one, is noteworthy, I also want to acknowledge her involvement in so many other areas of the Harvard Law School community. Membership chair of the Asian Pacific American Law Students Association, intersectional committee chair of the Women's Law Association, member of the Harvard negotiators and most recently co-chair for the first International Women's Day portrait installation of the Harvard Law School, a tradition that I'm counting on seeing repeated in the future. Now, Vivian, for all these reasons, we are delighted to present you with this year's Westfall Award. Now, next are the Dean's Awards for Community Leadership. Students receiving these awards have enriched our community as leaders, guiding daily work, organizing events, finding people to bridge differences across the campus, building a meaningful sense of we, both within particular groups and across groups. Through academic excellence, public service, and creative vision, these individuals are so impressive, and I will miss every one of them. The nominations for the Dean's Awards were submitted, again, by faculty, staff, and students. And I will ask you in the audience to refer to the activities listed for each honoree in the program and to hold applause until I say the names of each one. I will ask the awardees to stand up, initially facing me, and then face out to the audience and take the applause at the end after I've read every name. I just want to note that these individuals averaged over three and a half organizations in which they were uh, leaders, and they also, to a person, again, are simply extraordinary individuals. The recipients of the Dean's Award for Community Leadership are Christopher Michael Britton, Michael Frederick Decker, John Tugby Chippo Day, Kristen Ann Fleschner, Miriam Jamal Jordan, Joanne Tomella Carson, Kaylee Chisoil Kim, Mason A. Quartz, Christine Margaret Marshall, Alejandro Mont Rodriguez, Emily Rono, Ari Solomon Rubin, Jocelyn Ray Sedlet, Jeannie Siegel, Arvin Vikram Soheni, Ryan C. Stewart, Jean Wells Strout, Sarah Ashley Wheaton, Shadrach Tucker White, Johannes Valman. Defans. We are so honored by the involvement of everyone here today and the two amazing Class Day speakers, the awardees, 
selected by our students. And with pleasure, I turn the program back to the class marshals. Connie Sung will introduce the second of our class day speakers. I think you might have heard of her. Thank you, Dean Minow. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, Mom. <laughs> my name is Connie Sung, and it is my absolute delight to introduce our second class day speaker, Miss Mindy Kaling. <laughs> Miss Kaling, a native of right here in Cambridge and a graduate of Dartmouth College, is a comedic powerhouse. She is a quadruple threat an actress, comedian, writer, and producer. She has received popular and critical acclaim for her work on NBC's The Office, where she was beloved for her role as Kelly Kapoor, and for which her achievements as a producer were recognized with an impressive five consecutive nominations for the Prime Time Emmy Award for Outstanding Comedy Series. Ms. Kaling is also the creator, showrunner, and star of Fox's The Mindy Project, another popular comedy series that has garnered numerous accolades. Ms. Kaling's body of television and film work not only makes us laugh until it hurts, but it is also infused with smart social commentary. As one of the few women of color to headline her own American network television show, Ms. Kaling has broken barriers in the entertainment industry. Last year, like Mr. Barrara, she too was named one of Time Magazine's 100 most influential people in the world. So it seems that we have no shortage of people of influence on our stage today, on, on one side of the stage. <laughs> Now, I would call Ms. Kaling a personal hero of mine, but I've read her book entitled, Is Everyone Hanging Out Without Me? and Other Concerns, which, by the way, is a hilarious book. And it turns out that she doesn't like it when people tell her that she's their hero. Apparently, it makes her feel like 10,000 years old. So, although I won't use the term hero, I will note that Ms. Kaling has amassed quite a following here at Harvard Law School. We tuned in faithfully as the Mindy Project began in the fall of 2012, and as the office ended in the spring of 2013. As many of you know, certainly all of the students here know, law school is not an environment that is necessarily conducive to relaxation or to sanity. So we are incredibly grateful that Ms. Kaling, through her work, has provided us with much needed comic relief, insight, and inspiration during these last few years. Ms. Kaling has stated on multiple occasions that she is, quote, obsessed with justice. Well, it seems that she has come to the right place today to find some like-minded people. Please join me in warmly welcoming Ms. Mindy Kaling. Thank you. Thank you, Connie. Good afternoon, everybody. Graduates, parents, faculty, this is really such a remarkable day, obviously for you, but also for me. Because uh, after spending a life obsessing over true crime, the impossible happened. I was asked to speak at the Harvard Law Commencement and accept an honorary legal degree. Yes. Isn't that the American dream? Me, Mindy Kaling, so, daughter of immigrants. So there's no actual, you're not getting into okay. just that. Oh, no, okay. <laughs> okay, um, so apparently uh, there is little miscommunication. Um, I am no longer Mindy Kaling, Esquire, attorney, law, comedian, actress. I'm just, that's cool. No, I'm just supposed to stand up here and give funny remarks and then I'm supposed to sit down. That's okay. That doesn't seem fair, but that's okay. I'll do that. Um, I know what you're probably thinking. Mindy Kaling, why did they ask her? She's just a pretty Hollywood starlet. What does that quadruple threat know about the law? Sure, she seems really down to earth and pretty in like a totally accessible way. And yeah, she was on People Magazine's most beautiful people list this year and also in 2008, but what intelligent remarks could she possibly make about the law? 
She's probably too busy doing shampoo commercials. But I'm not too busy, you know? In fact, I would kill to do a shampoo commercial. So if anyone from L'Oreal is out there, please just Snapchat me after this. But um, <clears throat> I'll have you know, I do know a ton about the law because I sue everybody. <laughs> and excuse me, there is a burger named after me at Bartley's, okay? And they have guaranteed me that <clears throat> it is going to be there until another tertiary member of the cast of The Office gets their own TV show. And uh, they don't just name burgers after anyone there. Noted chef Guy Fieri has one. Noted drunk driver Justin Bieber has one. Okay, so that's pretty good company. Thank you. Look, I get it. On the surface, it would appear that I am an unconventional choice to speak here today. To be honest, I don't know much about the law. I graduated in 2001 from Dartmouth College. Thank you. An academic, that man is a drunk. Um, <clears throat> an academic institution located in lawless rural New Hampshire, where when you arrive, you are given a flask of moonshine and a box of fireworks, and you are told simply to, quote, go to town. <laughs> Except there is no town. There is only a forest and a row of fraternity houses that smell like urine. Actually, little known fact, Dartmouth has a law school. It's just one semester, and its coursework is entirely centered on how to beat a DUI. But I am not here to extol the virtues of the Dartmouth Red Bull School of Law. I'm, I'm here to talk to you. So, even though I have no idea why I was asked to speak here today, I prepared this speech very carefully, the way that any good Dartmouth-educated graduate would. I uh, drank a 40 of Jägermeister, then I called my dad to see if he would get me out of it. He's here today, he could not get me out of it. So I tried to hire a college freshman to write it for me in exchange for a $200 gift card to Newbury Comics. That didn't work out. <clears throat> Finally, seeing that I absolutely had to do this and couldn't get out of it, rolled up my sleeves, sat down at my computer, and tried to buy a commencement address off of movingcommencementspeeches.com. Yeah. My credit card was declined, so I had to write the thing myself, and here we are today. There are many, many distinguished speakers who have spoken here today. I am sharing the stage with Preet Bharara, U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York. We've heard what a great guy he is in 2012. He was named by Time Magazine as one of the 100 most influential people in the world, which apparently they're just giving out. <laughs> According to Time, he has battled terrorism as evidenced by his conviction of the Times Square bomber. He's crippled international arms dealers, drug traffickers, <clears throat> and dealt with financial fraud. Clearly, Harvard wanted you to see the full range of what India can produce here. <laughs> Mr. Brara fights finance criminals and terrorism. I meet handsome men in cute and unusual ways on television. And next season, my character might get a pet puppy. So. Is one more important than the other? Who can say? <laughs> Dean Martha Minow is here. She has fought for women, families, refugees, and is a champion for education. She has published over 15 books, such as Not Only for Myself, Identity, Politics, and Law. Dean Minow and I have a lot in common. I too wrote a book, as you know. It was called Is Everyone Hanging Out Here Without Me? You can buy it right around the corner at Urban Outfitters, next to a book called The Marijuana Chef's Cookbook. So, I digress, I, I digress right now. What I really wanted to say is that I am extremely honored to be with such a spectacular gathering of very smart and dedicated people. This graduating class has three Rhodes Scholars, 11 Fulbright Scholars, and four members of the Peace Corps. This group before me is bristling with ambitious young people many of whom have already started charities and philanthropic organizations. And now, with this diploma in hand, most of you will go on to the noblest of pursuits, like helping a cable company acquire a telecom company. <laughs> you will defend BP from birds. <laughs> you will spend hours arguing that the well water was contaminated well before the fracking occurred. One of you will sort out the details of my prenup, a dozen of you will help me with my acrimonious divorce. And one of you will fall in love in the process. I'm talking to you, Noah Feldman. <laughs> and 
let's be honest. Harvard Law is the best of the Harvard graduate programs, okay? I can say this. We're amongst friends, okay? The business school is full of crooks. The divinity school is just a bunch of weird virgins. The school of design is like European burnouts. And don't get me started on the Kennedy School. What, do you, what kind of degree do you get from there? Public policy? Okay, right, you mean a master's in boring me to death at a dinner party. I'm sorry, let's just be honest. The med school is just a bunch of nerdy Indians. You know, I can say that, by the way. Hey, hey, I can, the Preet can say that. The rest of you, you are out of line. That is racial, how dare you. But I digress again. I think I'm just really excited to be here. The real reason I am here is, as Connie said, um, I am obsessed with justice. Not so much with the law, but with justice. Actually, in my mind, law is that pesky thing that often gets in the way of justice. I believe in the Clint Eastwood school of the law. An eye for an eye? I don't think so. That solves nothing. You take my eye, I take your life, my friend. Okay? In a duel, Aaron Burr style. I don't want your stupid eye. For what, my eye collection? You're dead. Okay? Yes, duels are the first thing that you learn when you enter my graduate program, the Harvard School of Vengeance. But that, again, that is not what I came here to talk to you about. That's for the reception after. We can talk about that more. The Harvard Law School crest, which you can see in front of you, is, um, <clears throat> has the word veritas, which means truth in Latin. I know this because though I have been known as Mindy my whole life, my first name is actually Vera, which means, also means truth. It's true, it's actually too boring to make that fact up. And if you look at the crest, you'll notice that under this hallowed word, there are three bunches of asparagus. <laughs> because asparagus is the, the tallest and the proudest of the vegetables. The pillar of the vegetable kingdom, and it's, it's like the lot. Okay, that is, um, that is not asparagus. That is, that is wheat, right, which makes also not, not a ton of sense either. Okay, well, that was like three pages of my speech. Nope, okay, that was, that's a callback to asparagus. I have this really funny run about hollandaise. You'll never get to hear that. You know, this isn't going anywhere. I'm going to move past trying to make sense of your crest, which makes no sense. <clears throat> Harvard Law has an incredible number of illustrious alumni. President Barack Obama attended Harvard Law, or so he says. <laughs> Elle Woods went here from the trenchant documentary Legally Blonde. It's a very moving film. Dean Minow, you should check it out after you read my book, actually. Six of the nine Supreme Court justices are graduates of Harvard Law. The other three, I don't know where they went. I think it was like University of Phoenix. I'm not sure. No, no, no. As we all know, they attended your friendly rival, Yale Law School. Okay, let's just, can we take a moment to talk about this rivalry, everybody? I know that you have a chip on your shoulder, okay? Yale Law is always number one, and you are always number two. Sometimes Stanford comes in there, bumps you down to number three. But listen, let me tell you something. From where I stand, from an outsider's perspective, here's the truth. You are all nerds, okay? All of you. Except here's the difference. The only difference is that you are the nerds that are going to make some serious bank, all right? Which is why I'm here today, to marry the best looking amongst you, okay? And back to this beautiful diploma, this Harvard Law degree. It's not just a piece of paper. You can do whatever you want now, and this institution will follow you everywhere, okay? If you kill someone, you are the Harvard Law murderer. If you are caught in a lewd act in a public restroom, you're the Harvard Law pervert, my friend. And then you can represent yourself, and you'll probably get, a quick, you'll probably get acquitted because you went to Harvard, okay? In fact, the only downside of this degree is when you run for Senate, you will have to distance yourself from it to seem more like a regular person, okay? You'll tuck in your flannel shirt into your freshly pressed jeans that you just bought, and still, this institution is gonna haunt you. No matter how many diners you eat at, no matter how many guitar solos you do with Rascal Flats, you are Harvard to the grave. You won't be able to buy a pickup truck rusty enough to distance yourself from this place, all right? Mitt Romney, he preferred to be known as the Mormon guy to distract himself from his Harvard past. <clears throat> now I'd like to get a little serious for just a moment. 
I am an American of Indian origin whose parents were raised in India. My dad is actually here. They, um, they met in Africa, immigrated to America, and now I am the star and the creator of my own network television program. The continents traveled, the languages mastered, and the standardized tests prepared and taken for over and over again, and the cultures navigated are amazing even to me. My family's dream about a future unfettered by limitations imposed by who you know and dependent only on what you know was only possible in America. Their romance with this country is more romantic than any romantic comedy that I could ever write. And it's all because they believed, as I do, in the concept of the inherent fairness that is alive in America, and that here you could aspire and succeed. And my parents believed that their children could aspire and succeed to levels that could not have happened anywhere else in the world. <clears throat> and that fairness that my family and I have come to take for granted, and all Americans take for granted, is in many ways resting on your shoulders to uphold. You represent those who will make laws and affect change, and that is truly an amazing thing. And more than any of the other groups graduating this week from Harvard, what you decide to do in the next five to ten years will affect the rights of people in this country in a fundamental way. I'm now at the part of my speech where I am supposed to give you advice. And I thought, what advice could I give you guys? You know, celebrities give too much advice, and people listen to it too much. You know, in Hollywood, we all think that we are these wise advice givers, and most of us have no education whatsoever. Actresses can become nutritionists, experts in baby care and environmental policy. Actors can become governors, pundits, or even high-ranking officials and religions made up a mere 60 years ago. <laughs> For two years, I have played an obstetrician and gynecologist on TV, and damned if I don't think I can deliver a baby. <laughs> so then I was thinking, well then, who should be giving advice? And the answer is, people like you. You're better educated, and you're going to go out there in the world, and people are going to listen to what you say, whether you're good or evil. And that probably scares you, because some of you look really young. And I'm afraid a couple of you are probably evil. That's just the odds. And to be honest, it scares me, because you look like a bunch of tweens. I mean, this is ridiculous. Look at these kids in these suits. I mean, they're... So please, just try to be the kind of people that give advice to celebrities, not the other way around. You are entering a profession where, no matter how bad the crime or the criminal, you have to defend the alleged perpetrator. That's incredible to me. Across the campus, Harvard Business School graduates are receiving diplomas, and you will need to defend them for insider trading or possession of narcotics, or maybe both if Wolf of Wall Street is to believe. And the thing I, mind, the thing I find most fascinating is that you are responsible for the language of justice, for the careful and precise wording and all those boring contracts that I sign while I watch Real Housewives. You wrote the terms and conditions that I scroll, th I scroll through quickly while I download the update for Candy Crush. Terms and conditions are the only things keeping us from the purge, everybody. I don't read them, I just hit accept. iTunes may own my ovaries for all I know, okay? Employees must wash their hands before returning to work. A lawyer wrote that. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. A lawyer wrote that. Mindy Kaling may not come within a thousand feet of Professor Noah Feldman. A lawyer wrote that, okay? These are protections that we take for granted. Your dedication to meticulous reading is a tedium that I find just so admirable. You take words and you turn them into the infrastructure that keeps our world stable. The seductive Southern lawyers in John Grisham novels get all the glory. You're Noah Feldman's of the world. But the rest of you, you form the foundation of our day-to-day -day lives. It's, back it's backbreaking, and often there's not much glory in it. And in that way, a lot of you will become the quiet heroes of our country. However, those of you who go on to work for Big Pharma and Philip Morris, you will be the loud anti-heroes. And someone is certain to make an AMC series glamorizing you. So congratulations. <laughs> but basically, either way, you can't go wrong. I look at all of you and see America's futures. Attorneys, corporate lawyers, public prosecutors, judges, politicians, maybe even the President of the United States. 
Those are all positions of such great influence. Understand that one day you will have the power to make a difference. So use it well. Thank you, graduates. Thank you, faculty, parents, professors, families, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, movingcommencementspeeches.com. Congratulations. So here we are at the closing arguments, which in hindsight has got to be the worst job because everyone is cold and I just followed Mindy Kaling. But I guess bucket list item. Before we go off to the reception, I just want everyone to stop and think for a minute. Think about how we got here. Think about those people who helped us get here along the way. Somewhere, sometime in our educational experience, there was that one person who really helped us push through. This person could have been a teammate on a high school sports program. Could have been a parent in college. It could have been a significant other or a significant friend right here in law school. We might have been inspired by a professor, pushed to attend and complete law school by a former colleague, or spurred on by a classmate. This person or these people might be sitting here right next to you right now. And if so, I would encourage you to say a huge thank you. I want to thank my family who is in the audience today and who has supported me along the way. Um, because as Pre Parari said earlier, I was definitely that kid who was competitive playing Monopoly. As we remember and acknowledge the people who have supported us along the way, and as we continue for now as young lawyers to draw on the support and mentorship of, of others, let's each and every one of us pledge to support, mentor, and encourage those that come after us whether that be a future colleague, a future child, a younger sibling, or for those academic-minded people in the audience, a future student. The class marshals have really enjoyed working with the class of 2014, and we say congratulations to all of you. Please join us for the reception on Jarvis Field, and thank you.